Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, I'm hoping to have a very good discussion. And just to get one thing out of the way, uh, even though, yes, I do work for Bay Maps at Microsoft, this particular topic discussion is really not um, associated with Microsoft per se. Um, it was actually more of a, my personal interest and personal questions um, that were raised a few months ago over a beer with my friends. And so we decided why not do a panel at SOTM and so here we are. So if any of you are wondering how is what Microsoft has to do with this, pretty much nothing. So, okay, now that we have that out of the way, um, I wanted uh, to quickly uh, present to you our panel. Um, let me see. All right. Um, Uh, first off, we have uh, Ethan, Ethan Solgreen. Uh, he is a product uh, lead over at Carmera. Carmera is a, a, a New York-based uh, autonomous vehicle tech company. Um, we also have uh, Philip Kandel. Philip is a uh, VP of engineering at Telenav. Um, next, we have Kate. Everybody knows Kate. <laughs> Um, but most recently, uh, Kate's been uh, um, heavily involved with the OpenStreetMap Foundation, and she's also helped organize this amazing conference for us all. Um, <clears throat> next, we have Mark, Mark Prelu. Uh, Mark is uh, currently working um, at Mapbox. He is uh, working on strategies and partnerships. Uh, and last but not least, uh, Sandra Udbeck. Uh, Sandra is leading uh, image acquisition team at Mapillary today. So welcome our panelists. And uh, so the way that we uh, structured this, we would like to have a uh, somewhat open-ended discussion. We only have 30 minutes. Um, and actually, and the questions that you see on the slides behind me are kind of the immediate questions that popped into our minds when we uh, started uh, putting this whole panel together. And in fact, there's one very important uh, one that's missing here at the very top. There should be a question on what is an autonomous vehicle and um, how does it operate? So I would like to get started um, on discussing exactly what is AV Tech. Ethan, you work with Carmera. You guys are pretty much deep down in the trenches. Um, so do you, would you like to discuss that? Sure. So you can imagine that the autonomous vehicle ecosystem is really trying to replicate what you do as a driver of a car. So you need to be able to have senses like LiDAR and cameras to know what's going around the vehicle. You need to have a nervous system that carries that information back to the brain. That includes something like the robotic operating system, ROS, some of you may have heard of. Then you need a core brain that is making decisions about what it's interpreting in real time and moving the tires, turning the wheels, and making the blinkers go. Um, and then you need some sort of a memory, just like you have a memory to know where the vehicle is going. That memory is where map data comes in. And it gets used for two things. One is for localization, so being able to really highly accurately understand where the vehicle is in 3D space, down to sub 10 centimeters level of accuracy. And then the other is for path planning, where they need to figure out, well, where does this vehicle need to go? Um, and those two data sets need to be registered to one another so that they're really accurate together as opposed to using localization from one source and path planning from a different source. Okay, so that, thank you. That pretty much can lead us to the next question, um, which is, well, what do autonomous vehicles need from a map platform? So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to put some talking points here. Um, and this is mostly for you guys to read and think about and potentially, uh, you know, come up with questions. Uh, we'll do questions from the audience, maybe one or two, at the end of each one of these big slides uh, so that we can have audience participate as we go. So the next step is to really discuss what do autonomous vehicles need from a map platform. So do you want to get that one, Philip? Yes, absolutely. So. I think there's a lot of different schools of thoughts on that, but like basically as has been covered before is what do you use a map in an autonomous vehicle? Because the autonomous vehicle has all the sensors to orient itself in real time, right? I mean, like as a human being, I can put you in a car in a random place and you can orient yourself without a map. But the reality is like most autonomous vehicles right now, 
they still like their sensors have a lot of flaws. I mean, you read all of this stuff about like the latest Tesla crash and autopilot and so on. It's because they thought like that, like I don't know, they thought like a truck is like a sign up above in the road and it's not like a truck crossing the street and things like that. And the idea basically is that you use a map to cheat because you know what to expect. You, when you have like an expectation of like the reality, when you say like at that point there is a crossing, then you know that if you see something, then you know that it might be a truck and not a sign. Or if you know that you have like uh, recorded cars going on a certain road and you know that there's a panel above you, then you know most likely that like there's supposed to be a panel and it's not a truck. So what you basically use the map for is you use it to get a 3D representation of space to localize yourself and to know what other fixed objects to expect so that you know basically where can you go safely. And then basically whenever your like real-time sensors like they can calibrate against that. You get much higher accuracy. So basically by having like a base map, you manage to get like 10x less error rates. So that's kind of the purpose of a high accurate map to give you a real 3D representation of everything that's around you and that tells you basically where you are and then where, where you are in that space and then where you can go. Because like the sensors like radar to tell you like objects that are really close by, they're pretty good. But like other sensors to read like all the signs and so on, they're like flawed. So I think this is why you want to have this expectation of the reality of fixed objects that don't change on a minutely basis. That's kind of the idea which you want to get from that high accurate HD map. Okay. Yeah. And and then, and then I guess the problem is that these fixed objects are uh, not always fixed objects, that they're actually changing. The environment is changing all the time, so it needs to be uh, a certain type of, um, of freshness to this data that we uh, find on the map. Mm -hmm. To give a quick number to that, about 10% of the road segments change every year. 10 to 15% change on a yearly basis. So like the traditional mapping way that you drive your mapping van once a year, you would have like 10% of the map would be off, even if everything else in the mapping is perfect. So for autonomous vehicles, you need to go to real-time maps and not like static maps that are mapped once and then you forget about them. That's definitely not a good idea. That's an excellent point. Um, uh, another question that a lot of folks don't immediately think about um, when we're trying to differentiate the map for autonomous vehicle versus a map for a human being, it's, it's really like, uh, are the maps that are machine readable, are they uh, the same as a human readable map? And so, Mark, did you want to talk a little yeah, bit about that? Yeah, you know, that? I, we were saying, talking earlier and I was saying it, it's kind of unfortunate that we use the same word to describe them both because it, it actually in some ways would be clearer if we called autonomous vehicle maps something else. I mean, I think, I think one of the things, you know, maps have uh, that we're used to, we're used to teaching humans, and humans take a lot of the, the work out of it, but there's also things that are important to humans. Street names are important to humans and, and things like that. Autonomous vehicles don't really care about that that much. I mean, there, but there are other things that are very important to them, and, and, you know, the whole localization, the accuracy, and some of those things. And so, you know, one of the things that we get into is that many people, when we talk about mapping, think that autonomous vehicle mapping is kind of a linear progression from what we've all thought of as, in, in, say, in an OSM community as a map. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's linear or completely discontinuous. Discont um, it, it's a very different thing. Right. And, and I think that's one of the primary things that, that you know, these guys have been saying. Okay. Yeah. Do you guys have any additional points you want to discuss for, for this particular hearing? I'd say in terms of the living map, one of the other things to think about is construction events. If you think about kind of traditional standard definition maps of today, it's good enough for you as a human to just know, hey, there's a construction event on the road there. And when you get there with your eyes, you can figure out exactly where you need to go. For an autonomous vehicle, if it's driving on a virtual track down the road, it could get to that point and have no idea how to proceed and need a person to take over at that point. So having a living map that is really able to update in minutes, not even years, not even months, but detect that construction event, understand what is the new path to get around it, understand the width of that path, so if you're a big autonomous semi, you know whether you can actually fit there or not, is really important. It's not good enough to just say, oh, we're gonna keep this fresh on a daily basis. It's not good enough to say we're gonna keep this fresh even on an hourly basis. You need to be able to detect that event, understand how the underlying data changes, and get that change out to an autonomous vehicle in minutes so that the car can actually continue on its trip. You, you know, I have just a question for the panel, or, or I, I mean, it, it, at some point, for all the things about driving down a block and avoiding things and whatever, there is also the point of getting from point A to point B. I mean, at some point, that navigation doesn't go away. I mean, I'd be interested in your thoughts, but I mean, that seems like almost a parallel system 
rel you know, so there's one part which is I'm going from A to B, I'm gonna go down this street, turn on that street, go on that street, but then there's another part that actually guides the path. And, and do you guys see that as sort of a, a parallel system? So I, I definitely agree that you will have like the traditional navigation because I mean the same way before you call you're like if you think about an autonomous car it's basically like an, an Uber without the dude in front right if I order an Uber right now then I want to see the route then I like enter the destination I want to see how much it costs me I want to see if it understands where it goes so this is a very traditional like before you like call your autonomous vehicle you will have a very traditional routing and navigation experience that you show where the car is going how long it's going to take you so that's like even an autonomous vehicle is not going away that's like one point and then I think there's a second point is that humans generally don't trust autonomous vehicles so even if it works perfectly and it has like all this perfect 3D map it exactly localizes you exactly gets your construction sites one of the key things whenever we study that right we have like an autonomous driving license in California whenever we take like people in there is they get really freaked out because they have no idea what the machine is thinking so one of the key things is you want to visualize what the machine is thinking. You want to say like, okay, I'm going to turn the next street to the right. And I'm seeing there's like two cars driving beside you. And I'm, there's a car, there's a construction site in front. I'm braking now. I'm not like driving you against that wall and stuff like that. So a lot of that you need like a traditional map, right? Well, the car per se doesn't care about the street name it's turning on. The person in the car still cares about the street name that it's turning on because it will want to have the car translate what it understands into human understandable things. Even if the machine for operation wouldn't need that so I think like you still need to have the human level map for an autonomous car to interact because there's still going to be a human in the car even if it's not driving I also really like to think about this is you need a graph of graphs like imagine you're trying to take an autonomous vehicle from here to New York City you know trying to do that level of computation at a lane level accuracy across the entire country is very computationally intense and you don't actually need it to be able to determine the overall route to get from here to New York City. As you're driving along the way, you do need that lane level information to understand where to exit from the freeway or how to connect to specific things. But you can go with a course level graph to get that overall route and then refine to a more high definition level graph as you're driving down the road. Okay. Um, so before we move over uh, to our next point about um, how OSM fits in all this, I wanted to open up uh, for a couple of questions from the audience. Um, I don't know if we have anybody out there with the mics, but I think we're hogging all the mics, so. Start. Thank you. Hello. Okay. So ideally, then, the map would only be for the rider experience. Like you said, if you're in a Lyft or Uber, you, the, that's the way the rider is going to trust the riding experience, the traveling experience. But the example of the Tesla had in an ideal ITS future, cars will be connected to each other. So they're autonomous, but they're also gonna be connected to each other. And then there's also gonna be V2I. So the infrastructure is gonna be connected and then the car won't mistake a truck for a building, right? So in the ideal world where all the cars are autonomous and everything's connected to each other, the car per se won't need a map. It's only for us humans to trust our trip and to trust our car in a way and yeah. you know or I don't is that is that what you're saying or what no no, no. I mean the, the car still needs to have an idea where to go right so I think the car needs to have a map because it needs to know like based on current conditions which is the best way to go from A to B so I, I think that the map is not like even for the cars what I'm saying it's a different kind of map the map in the car doesn't need to have things like street names. It doesn't need to have those kind of things, but it still needs to have the ability to like localize itself to under find a path that's that's appropriate. Because like otherwise, it's very very hard if it doesn't like if it comes to a construction site and it doesn't know what's the other options to go to my destination. If it doesn't have a route map in there, then it's very hard. So what I'm saying is like this: that it's different maps for different purposes. I would think about it like right now when you have a pedestrian navigation map and a car uh, navigation map. They have like some intersections and some common areas and then some areas that are very specialized. So what I would see is like there is like a common area, like let's say the street network is the common, right? Like as a, as a person you want to have an understanding where the path of a street goes and as a machine you want to have an understanding where the path goes. But then one needs on top of it like human readable things like names and the other one needs things like 
3D objects for localization, which you as a, a human, if I tell you like where you are, there's a traffic light two meters in front to the left, and there's like a guard post on the right, and there's a rail on the right, that wouldn't help you at all, right? So that's totally useless for you, but very useful for the machine to like localize itself across these objects. So I'm saying like there's a common basis, and then there's specialized applications on top of it. So I think it can be like one map ultimately. Okay, thank you. Do we have additional questions? Mm -hmm. So you described um, the map uh, as a form of cheating for the car, um, which I, I, that's a really interesting way of putting it. It makes a lot of sense. Um, I was wondering if you, th if any of you thought that at some point the car would not need to cheat, um, because you know, like if you're if you're able to detect construction sites and figure out how to route around them, you know, it's, presumably you'll have to do that fairly quickly, um, like now. Um, but will you get to the point where you don't actually need such um, high definition maps, like pre-made, for the car to be um, safe and and whatnot? I think need is a very strong term. I think that at the end of the day, uh, you can drive a car without those things. There are examples of startups today that are using just standard definition maps and real time what they observe on the road to drive. But I think when it comes down to it, if you look for an optimal user experience of someone riding in that car, you absolutely need the map data. So an example of a place where we're working on sort of a differentiated experience. Again, this is really something that is five or 10 years out. But we drive vans all around New York all the time that are capturing video. And as they're capturing video, we identify people in those video and we localize all of them to street segments. So this gives us a pedestrian density map for the entire city. We can then layer that pedestrian density into the cost model on the graph for the vehicle that's driving down the road. And for an autonomous vehicle to be able to choose a road that doesn't have as much pedestrian traffic over one that does have pedestrian traffic is a huge time saver, cost saver, risk saver for that vehicle. So yes, could you navigate that vehicle without that information? Sure, but it would be a differentiator that would make you more likely to want to ride in the Uber with that information or the GM car with that information over someone who didn't have it. I think one very quick thing to add also to that, one way to think about it is like the best sensors right now, they see like 150 to 200 meters out. So let's say if there's like something drastic happening, let's say there's a complete road closure ahead. So the car could probably safely break in that distance that it'll say that, but it'll be not an optimal user experience if you're in your self-driving car and it like really has to break rapidly. If it knows already like by a, a real-time map, a kilometer in advance that there will be something coming where it needs to slow down. It can slow down already then and do it much more smoother. So this is like there is, I, I think the map will never go away because the sensors will never be able to see a kilometer out and so on. So while it can be perfectly safe to operate in that scenario, it'll never be optimal. So the map always adds advantages, like the similar things like you said, but also there's sensor distance is another aspect that the car will never be able to see all of that itself. Okay, thank you. Um, I think one more question for this section and then we'll move on to the next one, I think. Let me um, oh. Should go ahead or? Oh, hi. Um, so question, so uh, obviously we're at OSM conference, so there's some concept of maybe autonomous maps coming into OSM. Are there any strategies for dealing with the sort of legality around, um, you know, right now maybe everybody's building walled gardens around, <clears throat> excuse me, 3D data sets because there's a liability if there's a map error that leads to you know, a human accident, for example. So uh, are there any strategies that we could use to bring HD map concepts into OSM that could protect us? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Come on, Mark. <laughs> I, there's so many questions about that versus open street map and do so there's the legal side, and a lot of times what does come up is like, who do you get to sue, you know? And how does that fit into OpenStreetMap? Like, I'm the chairperson of the OpenStreetMap Foundation. Hey, <laughs> I guess, <laughs> please don't. <laughs> um, and you could presumably do that, but you wouldn't get any money because <laughs> there wouldn't be anything to get. So it's like balancing, like where's the liability fit in? And then go away from the legal part, because I always feel like OpenStreetMap is like the legal part and then the people and how they interact is, where, what does the community want as well? So how does that all fit together? 
That's right. Maybe, so maybe one, one sentence to the legal part, right? Think about that like, Linux is py powering like fighter py py uh, machines or stuff like that, like really machines that kill people. So the same as like autonomous cars. So open source technology is l used in like this very legally critical environments. Mm -hmm. And typically what happens, you have a company in between, like in, in a Linux space, it's like an IBM, a Red Hat, that basically takes that liability to make it like bulletproof, to have like quality processes in between. So typically would have somebody to take the open source project, harden it, and then like take the liability that like don't that, that nobody sues Kate, which we want to avoid. Yeah. First, a public service announcement. Whoever has our mic, could you give it back? <laughs> um, but uh, uh, the other, you know, the other question I think it goes to the slide back here is one of the we sort of looked at this as sort of if you're taking the positive approach, why is OSM a a, a good model for uh, autonomous vehicles? And one of the things that's being hotly debated is um, d uh, data sharing. Um, because right now you have a lot of companies that are collecting and using and developing data uh, in silos. So like this group has their data and that group has their data. And, you know. and, and one of the things is just from a safety perspective, um, the better the data, the safer you know, people are gonna be. And that's a huge issue. And so one of the questions that's sort of floating around is what about the concept of sharing data? And, and we were talking earlier that, you know, there's, I've heard a concept where cities that want to become autonomous vehicle hubs, because autonomous vehicles will probably happen in municipal hubs, will offer incentives and whatever, whatnot, but they may also require that people share data so that the overall product becomes a safer thing. Now, we were talking that has technical issues and it has political issues, um, but there are interesting things about data sharing, I think, that carry over into autonomous vehicles. Yes, and not only for, I mean, safety is the ultimate goal here, but also for like a competitive advantage, it's really hard for, for one company to map the whole world and to collect this data, and it needs to be fresh. So how do you do that? Can, are you able to do that by yourself? Or will you collaborate with other um, companies to do this so you can, you all have the same data, and then what you build on top of that is your competitive advantage? Yeah, absolutely, and I think that also begs the question, um, you know, if the data is shared, what does the OSM community do with that data, right? Um, so do you guys have any comments on that? Like, how can, how can the data that's collected by autonomous vehicles, how can it be useful for the community? What gets fed back to OSM and what doesn't? I mean, we all want the, uh, the OSM, OSM to improve, and if we have data that can improve the map, why not share it then to, to the community to use it to actually make the map better? Yeah, so we actually partnered with Mapbox uh, and gave a lot of our street level imagery that we run machine vision processes on to be able to do automated updates, uh, but gave the actual raw imagery to a team of Mapbox annotators who took it and updated turn restrictions throughout New York City and got a 40% improvement of those turn restrictions in Manhattan. And so I think that's a pretty good example of where you know, the collateral that needs to be made to be able to power autonomous vehicles can be used to be able to help OSM. Um, <clears throat> but the actual machine vision technology that makes those automated updates may not be. to say about that, no? Okay, so um, I think actually in our previous comments we've covered quite a bit of why OSM uh, is potentially the right platform for um, autonomous vehicles. Um, and we also talked about why it could not be because of the requirements um, that autonomous uh, vehicles uh, have today. Um, is there, are there any additional comments that you guys have for why OSM might not be the right map platform for autonomous vehicles? Um, yeah, you know, I, I think one of the things we were talking about is um, if you outline sort of what autonomous vehicles require in maps and where OSM, there, there are certainly some very obvious gaps there, including the fact that OSM isn't really built to do this sort of machine-based guidance thing. It's just the, the data types and all that are very different. Could it evolve there? Conceptually, it could. Um, you know, th th I think there are a lot of gaps to that. I mean, this morning we were talking about, um, there was some great sessions on machine learning and the ability of, to use machine learning to input to uh, the OSM thing. And, and as you know, there's some tension in the community about too much machine learning, how does that replace the community? When you go to these, it, I mean, you haven't seen anything in terms of machine learning compared to this, because this is gonna be very rapid, low latency machine learning pumped into the uh, thing. And so I think one of the questions that the OSM community is, you know, is that a good thing or a bad thing? You know, it may be that, that it comes to a place where it says that's not what we wanna do. 
And I think the OpenStreetMap community's intersection and collaboration with technology is kind of interesting. So if you think about, there's a rule in OpenStreetMap we call the on the ground rule. You're supposed to be able to easily observe what you're mapping and that's one of the intersections with the autonomous vehicles where a lot of the information needed isn't easily observable. But we think it's okay to, rec to use a GPS to observe the latitude and longitude, but that's not really human observable, you're using a machine. So how are we making the decisions of what technology is okay in our community and what is not? And you won't find one opinion there. I mean, one possible path that I see also there is that in the future you need to distinguish what is like automatic generated data and what's like a layer that's there. I think like things like movement speeds on segments and so on, they might not be not be easily observable ground truth, but you could just add them in a separate layer and then people could choose when they download the OSM, do they want to have it including that layers or not? Because those layers don't necessarily need to like change the base map. So I think like one, one thing that I certainly hope is that as a, as a community we figure out how to like use this data because I think the worst case outcome is that like for autonomous vehicles, all, everybody's going to use proprietary data, right? Then you're like back. I mean, the, the progress that OSM has made like to really make it possible to build a lot of things in the open, I think if, if we don't adapt the data models to like accommodate like autonomous vehicles, then we'll like take a, a massive step back because right now, every single autonomous company out there uses like proprietary data. And I think that's, that's at, at least for me personally, that's not the way where I want this community to go and where I want like this experience to go. Because I think autonomous vehicle technology is so fundamentally going to change all of our lives that we don't want it to be completely in the closed. So I think that's kind of my perspective. Okay. So I think we're getting close to uh, running out of time here. And obviously the purpose of this panel is to start a conversation, right? Uh, we have a lot more questions than we, uh, have answers to and we can potentially cover in 30 minutes. But what we would like for you guys to take away is some of these talking points. We want to start the conversations in smaller groups and potentially continue this in the upcoming uh, SOTMs. Um, so we have about a few minutes. Uh, we would like to open it for uh, a little more questions if the audience has questions. Okay. Sure. Go ahead. So you, uh, several of you have brought up safety with, uh, several times with respect to autonomous vehicles. You, you know, every time you bring up uh, something like safety, one thing that people think of is security, right? You know, so if, if I have some data, where did it come from? How do I know it actually came from there? That, that, that kind of thing. Um, you know, how, how, like it, in a data sharing platform for autonomous vehicles, which, you know, we've, you, you've, you've kind of theorized uh, OpenStreetMap could potentially maybe become, how do you see that working? Um, I'm not sure this is a, a great answer, but I, 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 my impression for a lot of these technologies is people are focusing on the first things first. And there are a lot of downstream things that people may or may not have fully processed or thought of. I mean, I think right now, um, the number one question, and some of these people may agree or disagree, the number one question that people are working on is this whole question of localization and, and how do you do that using a variety of sensors. And, and my impression for a lot of the community, or a lot of the people working on that is that is like problem number one, two, and three, and everything else is problem like last. And, um, and, and so I don't know, maybe someone else has a different opinion, but that's, my opinion is that there are many issues like that uh, liabilities, another one, distributions, and th there are a number of issues that, like that that aren't front and center in the development. When I talk to people, what they're really working on is localization. So I, I don't know if you guys have different thoughts. I guess my general thought is, well, that's in terms of all of the problems that we have within this space, that's a largely solved problem. You know, secure communication between client and server is something there are lots of companies working on today. I used to work at Amazon. It's a big problem for them. It's a big problem for banks. It's a big problem for lots and lots of different companies. And so once these core problems of how do you actually get a robot car to drive down a street safely is solved, which you can honestly do without any sort of server to client communication, you can store all of that information locally on the vehicle right now while you're doing R&D. Once we know that answer, solving problems like security is something we can totally solve. It's a known problem. 
Thank you. Do we have additional questions? So uh, for the safety, uh, we talked about the procedure earlier. So uh, how do you think like the procedure could be improved while capturing all this OSM data? Do you mind sharing one or two approaches around this? Thank you. So one thing that I'm really excited about, next year new uh, GPS GLONASS chips are coming out, right? So they have, have like an L5 band, which gets you down to like a meter localization in some areas. So that's going to be really exciting. Even in like in urban jungles, you get like up to a meter level accuracy. So like Qualcomm has, no, I think Broadcom or Qualcomm, I don't know who of them like launched publicly the next generation chip. So that's going to be out in phones next year. So you see like humongous improved localization on phones. That's one thing. And then the other thing is like, if you collect from cars, you have a lot of other sensors. You have like a 3D gyro in your car. So you can imagine like in a car right now over two kilometer distance without any tunnel, you can at the end of the two kilometer distance, you can still position yourself within like three to four meters accurate. So this is just using a 3D gyro. So I think one of the things is like combining different sensors, combining GPS, combining a 3D gyro, combining like barometric sensors, combining steering wheel angle speed and so on. So you can already get like with like production quality sensors, you can get like to meter or submeter uh, accuracy. And then a the second part is, it doesn't really matter how accurate you're absolute as long as you're accurate relative in many cases. Because the, the point is like, are you on the right or on the left lane? It doesn't matter if this is coordi X, Y coordinate, this or that. It matters like, do you know where you are in relative to like where you need to turn, where the building is in, rel in relation to you and so on. So that's more important than the absolute one. I just wanted to say in terms of the gyros and those sorts of technology, even though I think they're really powerful, I think people do need to understand that they work way better in X and Y than they do in Z. There are many opportunities where I see a vehicle you know, with a really high quality GPS and INS on it, driving around and get two meters level of inaccuracy in the Z dimension as it goes around a block. And that's really where using other data sources to do the localization becomes really important. Okay. Um, do we, we're pretty much at time now. Do we have time for one more question? Any other questions? <laughs> yeah, I, think, I think we had one uh, more question in the audience, and then obviously uh, I'm actually going to post the contact information for our panelists. You feel free to come up uh, and ask them questions. This conversation doesn't uh, just needs to continue. So, uh, just a quick question on on how you think about managing change detection across all these different data sources and conflating them together, and are there opportunities to learn from that to think about how we can better update OpenStreetMap? Yes, I think, I mean, definitely, like, once you have, like, the capability to build a real-time map platform, you can feed these changes also to the OSM community. And I think, like, I mean, ultimately, since the OSM community, they doesn't, they don't, most people don't really like automated edits, what you would do is you would create a change set for a human to review, and then when somebody reviews it, it gets to the map, right? So I think that's, like, probably the best that you can get at the moment. And... I don't know if I would say it was accurate that most people don't like automated edits. I think it's impossible to figure out what people in OpenStreetMap actually think because we have so many people and our methods of communicating are relatively um, old fashioned. Uh, and so I, I think things will change um, as we get used to things. Like my, how I mentioned GPS, we're used to GPS. It's in all of our phones. And some of these other autonomous uh, or technical tools will, will be less strange. So I don't know if this is a closing, but I, I think <laughs> it's an interesting question. I mean, you know, one of the things, and as I've gone to the autonomous vehicle things, there's a huge hunger in the industry for more data to do training for driving and all that. A lot of that data is visual. A lot of that data is telemetry. A lot of that data is point cloud stuff. All that stuff is a massive data, and some of it highly accurate. I mean, some of the stuff I'm seeing in computer vision around accuracy is just blows your mind. And 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 I think it, you know what we're seeing in our business is that a lot of that has a collateral benefit, as Ethan was saying, which is it directly produces uh, information, which can then either improve the accuracy of OSM or um, or improve the uh, the feature richness of it. And so so I think there's a lot of collateral benefit just from huge amounts of data collection. Okay, I, I think they could count uh, as a closing statement. I want to thank our panel for a very rich conversation today. I know you guys probably have a lot of questions. Uh, feel free to approach our panelists afterwards and continue. Um, so give them a round of applause, please. Thanks.